Assalamu alaikum and good, ne good evening to you all. My name is Asma and I'm the president of Hofstra's Muslim Student Association. I would like to thank you all for all joining us here tonight on behalf of our entire e-board. Tonight's event is in commemoration of Women's History Month as well as World Hijab Day. World Hijab Day celebrates Muslim women who wear the hijab, but it also opens up the floor for discussions, questions, and allows us to raise awareness about what the hijab encompasses. The recent spotlight placed on Islam and the hijab has created a lot of curiosity, but it has also led to the dehumanization of Muslim women by focusing on the hijab and not the woman wearing it. The constant narrative in the media that the hijab symbolizes submissiveness often makes Muslim women appear voiceless. We've also seen the hijab being increasingly politicized all over the world with over 61 countries having restrictions on the way Muslim women dress. This has led to Muslim women having to constantly prove their worth, defend themselves, as well as challenge negative stereotypes. Being visibly Muslim has caused hijabis to become subject to hate-based violence, discrimination, as well as harassment. We hope that tonight's event will serve as an educational opportunity and allow us to break down the negative narratives about women a part of a religion that is often misunderstood and represented in an extreme narrative. It is our pleasure to welcome our speaker, Roweda Abdulaziz, as a speaker for tonight. Roweda is an award-winning journalist who focuses on civil rights issues and social justice issues. Currently at the HuffPost, she spearheads the coverage of Islamophobia and its intersection with po politics, culture, and gender. Her notable work exposing anti-Muslim policies have led to the reunification of families and reopening hate crime cases. Fluent in Arabic, Roweda also has written numerous stories on the Middle East and covered refugee communities from Syria, Yemen, and other parts of the Arab world. Before kicking off tonight's event, titled The Discourse of the Veil, Beyond the Myths and Misunderstandings, I would like to thank the Center for Civic Engagement, Hofstra's Cultural Center, the Rabinowitz Honors College, the Department of Race, Culture, and Social Justice, the Department of Religion, and lastly, the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Can I please get an excited round of applause for our speaker, Roweda Abdulaziz. Good evening. I begin with the traditional Muslim greeting, the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, come on, Muslims. Oh my goodness, so sad. Ramadan's a week away, and this is where the energy level is at. We'll try it one more time. When I come in as a Muslim greeting my fellow Muslims, I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And you all say, Beautiful, beautiful. And for the non Muslims, we'll get you to, to practice a little bit. It is a beautiful, beautiful greeting, a greeting of warmth, peace, and compassion. It is a greeting that often gets overlooked, but more importantly, gets vilified and taken away. Not because of the origin of the meeting, but because how the words come together and the sounds of the letters and the vowels, the way it hits. Perhaps it reminds people of a terrorist plot in a movie in Hollywood. Or if you're kind enough, maybe Drake's lyrics in his very poorly sung song, Yalla Habiti. <laughs> no, no Drake fans? Okay, we're just going to gloss over that one. Nonetheless, I am honored and excited to be here with you all to have an engaging, honest, and real conversation about the experiences of Muslims and Muslim women in particular. Um, like Esma, a little bit about myself. I am a reporter at the Huffington Post. I cover Islamophobia and other social justice and civil rights issues. So what does this mean in, in tangibility? It means that I'm probably going to be employed for a while, thankfully. It also means that the conversation around Muslims and Islam is one that's perhaps not quite reflective of the community. And I'm not here to say right or wrong from a theological perspective. That's not my goal, nor do I care for that. But from a perspective of not just tolerance, because that's bare minimum. But we're talking about understanding compassion, why that's so important, but we're going to keep it big picture for a little bit. Some stats about the Muslim American community, since we're here in the U.S. and that's what we're talking about. 
the first Muslims who arrived to the U.S. We're going to have a little bit of a pop quiz, and I know you, perhaps you weren't hoping that this was class time, but bear with me. We're whom? We're talking about the very first Muslims in the U.S. Yes. Yes, African-American black Muslims, those who perhaps didn't have a choice, not perhaps, but did not have a choice in coming into this country. So when we talk about the origins of Islam, we're talking about black Islam. That's very important to remember, and I'll tell you why. Actually, I'll tell you why now. Because when we think about Islam, or when we think about the perception of Islam in Muslims, what is the race that tends to come up? Middle Eastern, or? South Asian, because it seems to people, or perhaps people creating certain movies or films or TV depictions, that all Muslims are Arabs or Indian, Bengalis, Persians, etc. When speaking from the Arab population, not all Arabs are Muslim. And actually, most Muslims don't even live in an Arab country. So breaking down the very basic facts, Islam 101, we got to talk about the diversity here, people. The origin of America are black Americans, and the origin of Islam is black Islam. And that is important because when we're reading about Islam in the textbooks, I'll tell you, in my public school, I remember so distinctly, the first time the word Islam came into my textbook was the same class session we were learning about 9-11. And so that's got to say something. It said to me as me when I was 13, and I didn't know much about the world, but I knew that was wrong. I know how it made me feel, like Maya Angelou once said. It's not about the words that you say, but how people feel. I know how that made me feel when talking about my faith, that we were talking about it after we are talking about a catastrophic event that happened not too far from here. And this is when we're talking about how I pray at home, how I celebrate at home, how I find comfort in difficulty at home. We're talking about September 11th. So that's one fact. Another fact, what is the fastest growing Muslim American population? Who knows, ethnically? Hmm? Latino. The Latino population is the fastest growing Muslim American population. They are outnumbering immigrants from Egypt or those who are coming from Pakistan and are having children. We know we love to have our children, yes. It is the Latino Muslim community. So if we're talking about the origins of Islam, we're talking about growth, we're talking about diversity. Here are two communities who are constantly and, and, and deliberately at times erased from the conversation. And that is something to ponder on and to think about because again, when we talk about perception, when the most basic facts get left out, some through ignorance and not knowing any better and some through intentionality, we have to ask ourselves why we see these commonalities and these themes come over and over again. So that is just two examples. When we're talking about women, it's no different. Women who choose to wear the hijab, women who don't. Women who choose to wear the naqab and women who don't. And the women who are in between, and that is most of us, finding the journeys of where we want to implement this deeply personal and spiritual aspect in our faith. Where does it fit in? Some of us have it figured out. Some of us don't. I don't most of the time, especially when I'm trying to get dressed and it's telling me it's going to be 40 in the morning and then 80 in the evening, and then you're just like, I don't know what to wear as a hijabi. This is really hard. No, no hijabis. Damn, this is a tough crowd. I promise this is a little bit more lighthearted than you think. Not a lecture. I don't fight. <laughs> So when we're talking about diversity, and I want us to really, with this exercise, break the images is my TLDR of this intro. The perceptions that we think about, that we consume on a daily basis that perhaps is more of our subconscious. We don't happen to think twice, except when I walked into Target and I saw an American hijabi model on that billboard, I thought, wow, that's crazy. I wonder how much flack they got. Because it's not a wow. That's so amazing. And also just like another part of our day. Because this concept of representation is so scarce. It's so minimal. It's handing breadcrumbs to our pets. And that's what it feels like a Muslim woman sometimes. When the perceptions are not just completely wrong, that when they're just normal, 
I got a 14 year old girl just smiling, wearing her cute little pink t-shirt in Target, that that stops me in my tracks. And that may be a beautiful thing to celebrate, but why is it a one-off? And why did it stop me in my tracks to begin with? So the, this, is, this is the mentality I want us to go into through what, the next 30 minutes that we have together, uh, excluding the Q&A. This concept of breaking down the misconceptions and the barriers, it doesn't have to be a big aha light bulb moment. It's not going to be some big thesis. I'm not gonna present to you findings of a paper, but should I want you to question the motions of your daily life, whether that's the textbooks that you're learning from in school or the ads that you see when you go shopping? How are we being more critical of the perception of a community that for so long was determined its value and its worth by something else, by someone else. People behind a news camera, or behind a Hollywood camera, or even just the online. We all good? We agree with that premise? Understand me so far? Okay, awkward moment here. I'm gonna ask a lot of questions. And I like to do the thing where it's just like the person who I feel like doesn't really wanna answer my question, you're gonna answer my question. I got picked on a lot in school, I have the power now. This is me getting my justice. I'm just joking. All right, so when we think about stereotypes, and I think we all know what stereotypes are here in the US. Talk to me a little bit about stereotypes about Muslim women. What are some common ones? Don't cheat and tell me one that I already wrote up there. Very submissive, really good. Usually submissive to who? Men. That they don't have agency in ownership that they are not allowed to make their own choices. And that includes wearing the hijab or perhaps going to school. Now, huge caveat here. I am by no means a walking representation of a faith of 1.6 billion. Absolutely not. I barely know how to make decisions for myself. But generally speaking, when we're talking about stereotypes, right, we're talking about mass strokes and generalizations, are there women out there who are forced to cover and wear the hijab when they don't want to? Yes. Are there governments who decide to take a religion and a faith and manipulate it for their own political gain? Absolutely. Is this exclusive to Islam? This is where I hope people are going to say no. And if you're not, it's my job to hope to get you to maybe think no by the end of our time here. And this is the key difference. We are not overlooking the harsh realities that exist in this world. So if we're gonna pick out the problems in Saudi or in Iran, I'm gonna pick them out just equally as here in the US or in the UK. Because no country has got their shit together, right? No people is living in this beautiful democratic society where everyone is flourishing and thriving and racism discrimination doesn't against. Yes, we agree? Yes, okay, good. Making sure that I'm not being the pessimist and you guys are like, well, my life is great. What are you talking about? Long Island is amazing. We have no problems here. I call you a liar. All right. So when we're talking about the perception of Muslims, American Muslims, we've broken the diversity. Everyone has freedom of choice. Some places are bad. Yeah, we're all in agreement. Anyone want to fight me on that? No? OK, cool. I haven't been to the gym in a while. I can't. So submissive was one. What's another one that we think of when people are perpetuating stereotypes against Muslim women? They don't have any rights, right? Their rights are not given to them, whether it's in the home or from a government level, right? And so some other ones, they're constantly in need. They're oppressed, the big O word. They are submissive. They're uneducated. That they are essentially deemed voiceless. They're second-class citizens. That they are women that they don't know what's good for them, so someone has to make that choice for them, whether that's a form of a man or a form of an institutionalized system, and sometimes both. And so when these messages that are constantly being bombarded into what a Muslim woman is simply because she exists, simply because she decides to cover herself in a specific way, simply because she happens to establish herself with a certain Islamic faith, the certain faith, the Islamic faith. So why, where are these narratives coming from? And how did we get here? Now that's a long story I'm going to have to save it for your history teachers or for yourselves. But we're going to go through some of it as to how we got here. Because understanding the history is the first step forward into 
solving the problem. Yeah? OK, amazing. Asma had mentioned today that it is Women's History Month. It's also World Hijab Day, or it was World Hijab Day. And it is also so many days to keep track of. The International Day for Combating Islamophobia. It is a day marked by United Nations last year. And it came after a string of terrorist attacks, especially what happened in Christchurch. Anyone know what happened in Christchurch, New Zealand? Somebody tell me. Oh, I'll bring it back. Yes. Yeah, it was a terrorist attack. Let's call it for what it is. A man decided to storm two mosques and kill, I think it was 51 people, just because they happened to be Muslim. And so when we were talking about impacts and consequences of messages, that's a clear one right there. And we're going to get to that very quickly. So Islamophobia, we're discussing what? Islamophobia is and isn't. Islamophobia is an irrational hatred and fear of a community, right? And there's so many dish definitions. This is not technical. This is just ones that I've come up with through my years of research and reporting on the issue. It is not, I dislike you because you pray differently. It is, I don't think you should have rights. I think I should cut you in line when I'm at Starbucks because I'm the better person. It is, I should police the way you eat, dress, think, and act because you happen to, leave, happen to believe in a creed. When we're talking about Islamophobia, it is discomfort in the grocery stores. It is also a policy that we had not too long ago that banned people because they happen to come from a Muslim-majority country. It means you are not allowed to dress that way you want to dress when you're going to the beach because this is a place where women undress and not put on more clothes if you're swimming in the water in France. <laughs> parts of Italy, <clears throat> Austria, <clears throat> parts of Egypt and Morocco. So Islamophobia is not necessarily a non-Muslim person disliking a Muslim person. We're talking about we're talking about an imperialist ideology. We're talking about a nationalist ideology. We're talking about a xenophobic, a racist, a sexist ideology. All of them into one because a person happens to be Muslim. Now, that may sound big and scary, but how does it affect the day-to-day -day lies of our women? And that is a new coined word. We call it gendered Islamophobia, right? So the intersection of being a woman and being a Muslim. And the intersections continue, right? But this is the one that we're going to focus on today. That women, particularly women who choose to wear the hijab, they are visible markers of their faith. They're walking around saying, I'm Muslim. And so the reactions and the consequences of whether that we're talking about policies or whether we're talking about that incident in Starbucks happens to be because how a woman looks. And I love my Muslim brothers, but in this sense, they kind of got it easy, right? If Mo was just going to Starbucks, Mo was just going to Starbucks, he was a racially ambiguous man, right? If he happens to come from like a Middle Eastern background, right? And that's just the one I'm picking on because that's where I'm from. But if you're a Muslim woman, you can you can call yourself Mo. People are gonna be like, yeah, Mo. I was once quick story. Once I was in Boston. Um, I should probably end the story there. No, I'm just kidding. I was in Boston a couple months ago, and I went to go get pastries from a pastry shop. And the woman on the other side went to her woman next to her, and she went like this. I was like, cool, 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 cool. Just hanging out in Boston. Just kidding. I left. Right. And so. Something like that I can laugh about now, but when we're talking about it from an institutionalized level, right, if we're looking at what's happening in policing women's bodies, right, when we're talking about the, have, have you guys familiar with what's, what happened in France when it comes to the burkini, right, Muslim women who want to wear the burkini is just the non-technical way of saying like a full clothing bathing suit um, because they just wanted to swim and they happen to wear what it looks like, a swimmer's gear, you got leggings, you got a top, you got a hijab, we're told you can't. If you undress, you can swim. If you can't, if you don't want to, you gotta go. And they were facing fines. In other parts of Europe, there have been niqab bans, there have been burkini bans, all in the name of democracy and tolerance, ironically. 
So this is when we're talking about a gendered Islamophobia. So something that is particular that Muslim women face, right? Especially if you happen to be a visible Muslim woman, not all the time, but perhaps the male counterparts of this community are not facing. So this is what I mean when I say gender Islamophobia. Does it make sense? Islamophobia versus gender Islamophobia, technical terms? Okay, cool. We're going to keep going. So I want to throw some beautiful facts here when it comes to the actual and real life lived experiences. We got over the doom and gloom. We're going to talk a little bit about the positivity. Wait, no, we're not. We're going to doom and gloom for a little bit. Stick on the doom and gloom. So this is a statistic, a statistic made by the ISPU. They are a Washington, D.C. think tank organization, also founded by a Muslim woman. Credits to her. Her name is Delia Mujahed. She did a study. It was called the American Muslim Woman Poll. And here, this particularly talks about the experience of discrimination that Muslim women feel um, compared to other people, right, other uh, racial and gender um, lived experiences of discrimination. That was a very long-winded way of saying that. So we know Muslim women bear the brunt of the discrimination when it comes to Islamophobia because they are visible markers unlike their Muslim men. Okay, we talked about that. We talked about how they were perceived. Okay, we're going to keep going here. The facts about hijab. Okay, now that we're going to get to the meat of it. We mentioned it a little bit earlier. Hijab is a deeply personal choice. For the majority of women, who choose to wear the hijab. And this particularly pulled the reasons as to why Muslim women wear the hijab, right? And I don't know if you all can see it. We have up top, right? It says piety, religious reasons, spiritual reasons. They want to wear it because they believe in their faith, either commands them to, they want to partake in it, etc. After that, so other people know I'm Muslim. Third reason, modesty. Last one, someone required me to. Honest, real answers from American Muslim women. So when we're comparing what the predominant narratives say about the hijab versus the lived experiences, we got to talk numbers. And this is just a nice graph that I figured we talk numbers, emphasizing. In addition to emphasizing this, I also want to emphasize that it also physically looks different. A Muslim woman in Egypt, her hijab may look very different from a Muslim woman in Nigeria. And, and her hijab will be very different from a Muslim woman in Malaysia. Right? And if you go across the continents, etc. So the physical markers of hijab will vary by color, by style, by tradition, by culture. It is not this one fixed molded thing, which, i.e., if we, according to Fox News, it's a long black garb where a woman is seen crying because she can't wear anything else, and God forbid she wear a pink one. That's not, that's not the case. Maybe in Iran, but it's not the case here. And it's not the case in the majority of these countries. You'll see it among your peers how they all decide to dress differently. And it is a personal expression in addition to perhaps, yes, I'm wearing it for spiritual reasons, but I'm wearing the beige hijab today because I like neutrals. I had someone once ask my mom who was wearing a black hijab and she had like a tiny little white piece up front. The woman was like, are you a nun? And my mom was like, close. She's like, because you're wearing black and white. My mom's like, okay, cool, good to know. I didn't stop her from wearing black and white hijabs, but she did nonetheless. So when we're talking about styles and colors and expression, it is a lot more beautiful than we give it credit to. It is a lot more beautiful from an internal perspective, but externally, it's gorgeous. And if you want to see, we have the month of Ramadan coming in like nine days. After Ramadan, we have Eid, and damn, Muslims are fleeky. Right? We look good. Because, not because we want to flex, that's partly the reason, but it is in the faith tradition that after going through this difficult month of fasting, of trying to achieve God consciousness, of really struggling, I mean, you talk about caffeine withdrawals, find me on day three in my bed, not going out. But find me on Eid, oh yeah, let's go. And this is the beauty of Islam. This is the beauty of our faith that doesn't get to get shared. I don't get to tell my coworkers and my friends that textbook that I learned in history didn't talk about how Muslims pride themselves on being in good health and good hygiene and looking good on a day of celebration and joy because joy is not the goal of disinformation. Joy is not the goal of Islamophobia. Humanity, celebration, positivity, is not what they want you to associate with this faith community. It's be afraid of them, fear them, or they fear you. 
the ironic clash of civilizations that we won't get along together because they're different. They're that type of different. Education, uh, they may be in your classrooms, but at home they're doing some weird things. It creeps up in the most aggressive forms, targeting mosques and killing people in Quebec, in Christchurch, here in the U.S., South Carolina, Chapel Hill. Right? Three Muslim students were killed. We're talking about when a woman was walking and commuting back to New York City, she was pushed down the subway tracks. We're talking about workplace discrimination. A study found that if you had a Muslim name on a resume, you were not likely to get hired out of the UK. It is the visible markers. So when we're talking about what are the images and word associations, think about that really cheesy cloud that we all used to do in our PowerPoint classes. Think about that cloud when you think about Islam and ask yourselves why some of them may be more prevalent to you than others. So these are the facts. We talked about that facts about hijab. I wrote a story a couple years ago that documented the experiences of Muslim women while swimming in the U.S. It's one of my favorite stories for different reasons. One, it talked about the history here in the U.S. and how we used to police black Americans at bodies of water. We did the same thing. They couldn't swim in the same pools. We watched them at beaches. It also talked about the fashion intersection, which I absolutely love. Two things you don't think will go together, but they do. And how there's actually a rise in modest wear. What's in right now? Is anyone wearing skinny jeans for the people who are younger and hipper than me? It's all about the wide leg pant. Like two summers ago, it was all about the maxi skirts. And so sales are increasing, but depending on who wore it, that mattered. Because if a Muslim woman wore it, oh, that's just oppressive. But if you've got an influencer on TikTok that wears it and tells you you should buy this for like $238, apparently that's trendy. So I focus here on the intersection of fashion, of the racial segregation of this country, of politics, and of gendered Islamophobia. A lot of themes I know. I hope you read it. But I want you to read, I will read this quote from this woman. Her name is Manor Hussain. Um, we went on this beautiful, beautiful August day to the beach, and it was her first time swimming in the U.S. after she had sworn off swimming because of a negative experience that she had. And we were having conversations about what that moment felt to her and why she decided to wear the hijab. And so she told me, I kept my hijab on as a form of resistance, but that's not always easy. If I'm going to truly commit to this resistance, I also have to not just do it for the revolution, I have to do it for my own joy. I deserve that. I read this quote from Anar on like a daily basis. It is one thing to say, I'm going to dismantle the stereotypes. Anyone come ask me as a Muslim woman, Islam one-on-one, -on -one, I got you. That's hard. Can you imagine being 15 in public school and you happen to wear the hijab and someone wants to ask you, what does your faith say about X? And you're like, I don't know, I'm just trying to do my algebra homework. And yet Muslim women take this on. I took this on. We all feel like they need to walk around as brand ambassadors for a faith that's complex and messy and beautiful and culturally diverse. And Manor knew that. And she committed to it. But she said she wanted to do something for herself. She wanted to wear for her own joy. She knew her value. Even if that meant swimming at a beach where everyone else was staring at her because she happened to have a couple more layers on. I absolutely love this quote. I mean, she's a brilliant, brilliant woman. So all of this to say, despite the challenges that Muslim women face, and going back to statistics, they're also thriving. They're not just keeping their head above water. It's not gut punch after gut punch and they're barely breathing. The statistics say that Muslim women actually sur surpass Muslim men when it comes to education degrees. They're more likely to get a higher education degree. They're more likely to be allies for different social justice movements. And I think this one specified the Black Lives Matter movement. They're more likely to donate, right, to charity than their male counterparts. And so these are, this is saying something. And forget this, this is saying something. Your Muslim friends are saying something, right? Your colleagues, your coworkers, your educators, your community members, they may have it tough, but they're still doing it because they want to. They want to be here. 
They want to be in Long Island despite all the problems. They want to be in the U.S. They want to hold on to their faith. And they want, they want their, their cake and they're going to eat it too. Because they deserve it like any, every, anyone else. Like everybody else. No matter where you come from or what you believe in. And this is to me is inspiring. Because this right here tells stories that we are not hearing from. And these are just some, some examples of stories that I've told over the last few years. That we need to move away from the good Muslim, bad Muslim, oppressed Muslim woman, you know, one that's empowered. There's everything in between, that journey that we were talking about earlier. We're talking about the experiences, right? We're talking about the diversity of, of folks, so like the black Muslim woman I had written, talking about what happened in COVID and the different uh, things that Muslim women were doing to realign their communities and create safe spaces for women when we couldn't go to the mosques and the centers. I want stories that are different. I wanna read stories that are different. I wanna read a story and send it to my friend who is not Muslim to be like, this is a good piece of journalism. This is representative, not this is not, this is representative of the Muslim faith, but this is something that I haven't thought about before. So I challenge us when we're consuming news and consuming movies and consuming anything, especially when it comes to the Muslim community, is it different and refreshing? Or is a little bit of a confirmation bias there? Either way. And what is your role in consuming, sharing, and reading things that are actually factually correct? about the communities that we reside in, that we study with, and that we hang out with, et cetera. And that goes back to the concept of honoring a Muslim woman's whole self, every part of her. And Esma said beautifully, where the obsession becomes where the cloth starts and ends, and not the woman that's wearing it, and not her experiences. Those that are difficult and tough, and those are empowering and rewarding and everything in between. Because the best form of resistance that we all can do, as Manar said, we don't have to put on a hijab. I think one practice of World Hijab Day is people practicing putting on a hijab and trying it on for a day. I don't need you to do that. That's fine. You want to do it? Cool. If you don't want to do it, also cool. I just want you to check some of your own emotions that you have when you see a Muslim woman walking by. I want us to check the things that we're reading. I want us to have honest conversations difficult conversations as to why perception of a faith community of a particular woman looks one way and perhaps the woman that I know in my classroom is something different. And when we have those conversations internally, the domino effect begins. Because when a society doesn't let its country put in a policy that's problematic, and we saw that with the travel ban, the way people storm the airports. We saw that in France where men were paying off the fines of these women. There are good examples out there. But you don't need to find those examples to be motivated to do it. You should be those examples yourself, Muslim or not. I thank you all for listening. I'm really excited for the Q&A. And I end my remarks with the same way that I began with the Islamic greeting of peace. And that is, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Damn, still no one answered. <laughs>
Um, what I found most fascinating or most interesting to me was when you spoke about um, the bans on the hijab in European countries, also the Middle East. I'm also Middle Eastern, so I'm pretty familiar with the bans in Egypt. I was recently in Egypt, and that was one of my concerns as well when I was going to certain hotels. Um, luckily, I didn't have to face that. Um, but when it comes to those topics, especially in the West, my question to you is what is your opinion on secularism? Because um, when it comes to these countries like France and Italy, their reasoning as to why they ban the hijab, burqa, and et cetera, like all of the different Islamic, let's say, dress code, um, they say it's secularism. So I would love to know what your take is on that and what your opinion, like if you were in front of, let's say, the president of Italy or France, what would you say to that? Hope I'm never in that in, the, <laughs> in that position. I mean, I would have to push back. How do they define secularism, right? And I would have to also then continue to question, well, what about other people, right? If they also want to express their faith, folks from the Jewish community, folks from the Buddhist community. And why is this concept of wearing something going to crumble and threaten a society's principled values of secularism democracy and freedom it just like the kids say the math ain't mathin right and so I think going beyond the responses is really important and, and getting the receipts understanding who is putting the policies in place who the policies are predominantly impacting and what are the benefits and the pros and cons it's a very journalistic answer and I think when you assess the answer to those questions I think it'll be pretty clear as to perhaps maybe why something isn't necessarily secular, or at least secular in the sense of uh, promoting tolerance and, and equality as they, they think it is. So it's just the, the premise of it to me is, is problematic. Thank you. You have a question, Hamid? I know we have one in the back too. Um, uh, I was just thinking like, uh, I recently watched uh, ja Jack R Jack Ryan, like season one, like before the semester started, uh, and I just converted to Islam eight months ago. So, um, I was just saying, like they, of course, they didn't portray it in that show that well, and it was really annoying to see, like, because I, my family and other people I've known have watched it, and they recommended it to me, and it was just I didn't like it. And then, um, like recently, or like I watched a little bit of the Miss Marvel show on Disney Plus, and they. They showed Islam in a more, of course, nicer light, but they also made a lot of jokes uh, towards like the Pakistani culture and stuff. But I'm, uh, my question is like, how would, um, how how would you, I guess, uh, portray is Islam or being m Muslim or Muslim in in the media where it's like not offensive or it's not joking or it's like, or like in comparison, like how would we represent it, like like Black Panther or like some Latino like bad bunny something like that I don't know so yeah Muslim bad bunny that sounds great <laughs> I mean I, I don't work in film so but I think here's the thing when it comes to film and movie and, and this industry there's it's not meant to be the perfect reflection of Muslims right like it's entertainment and that's what it's supposed to be and it's not like oh we should never talk about Muslims because they're always going to be offended somehow some way and that's actually a very it's a stereotype right and we hear this quite often from folks I think there's a way to do it tastefully and could be funny. Um, are there examples out there? Yes, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but there, there are ones where you watch and your gut, you're just like, this is funny, this pokes fun at my cultural background or, or you know, an experience that I went through and I can laugh at it and like it's fine and harmless. And then you have other examples where you're just like, well, that's kind of mean, right? And or that's just cringe. Like that's just like not funny at all. And I think, the unfortunate thing is searching for it in just like the piles and piles of entertainment is hard. I mean, I think there are so many organizations and actors and actresses who are come up who are trying to challenge that narrative. Now that's also going to depend on the taste from one Muslim to another, right? Like one Muslim watching a show is gonna find something funny and the other person's going to find it to be offensive and problematic. It is not a one type of solution. I don't think we should be getting our educational material from entertainment anyway. Uh, nonetheless, it's a very fluid gray area. I don't think there's a one size fit all for this. I have not met someone who's come up with it and I'm very skeptical that there's like 
a guide sheet PDF floating around being like, if you're going to make a movie about Muslims and like, this is the way to do it. It really, I think is largely going to depend on the audience and different types of Muslims. And I think that's, that's the beauty of having a diverse community. We're all going to react to things differently. Um, mine is less of a question and more of a comment um, of something that I found really interesting is that when you went on one of the statistics slides as to the reasons why Muslim women wear the hijab, one of the biggest misconceptions that I had was that a really great percentage of American Muslim women wore the hijab because they were forced by their families, even though I myself have never even met in all the Muslim girls that I know, like a woman who's really been forced by her family. But like, I feel like that misconception is so widespread in the media and everywhere that it kind of just like ingrains itself in your mind even as a hijabi without even knowing it so to see like the one percent number was so shocking to me and, and, and it's honestly very it like lightens my heart a little bit to know that like that's not what a lot of the women in America are suffering through and I didn't even know that there were like Muslim women who are doing these kinds of studies and looking at statistics for us it's just really it's a really nice feeling to know that, that that that's there and I was like thank you for showing us you know thank you for reading it solidarity is important right it's one one more reason as to why we shouldn't feel alone other questions yes I'll get my steps in today <laughs> I think for me, um, I've been a hijabi for a really long time. And as far as I can remember, I've been a feminist as well. So for me, I've struggled with being both. Unfortunately, the feminist movement in the US at least is very um, white, w like uh, cisgendered women, female, and it doesn't really promote supporting Muslim women. What are your opinions on that? Why do you think that is even though as women and as a society in the US, we're growing so that we represent all types of women of backgrounds and looks and, and everything. However, we haven't gotten to that point where we're seeing a lot of support in comparison to our peers when it comes to hijabi Muslim women. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think you answered your own question a little bit. When we talk about the history of the feminist movement, it was a movement for a very specific type of woman, right? Even at the time, right, we're talking about when slavery was still very fresh, they were just like, black women, eh, this is mostly a white woman thing, right? When we're talking about the right to vote, I didn't think about the right to vote for black women, it was mostly for white women. And I think very recently we started having this conversation, right? Everyone's talking about Kimberly Crenshaw, the term intersectionality and the concept of intersectional feminism, et cetera. And that just has to catch up. I think we just need to catch up to this concept. It doesn't, it should not need a concept. When we're talking about empowering women and their choices, we should talk about every woman and her choice. But I think because the way the country was founded and the way our politics originated, I'm not saying that's where we are now, but that is going to have a very heavy influence as to how everyone lives their lives, whether that's me, whether that's the, con like, you know, whether that's the feminist movement, whether that's how we do uh, our education, right? Just because of years and years of institutionalizing the same values and principles. And until we start criticizing, we're not criticizing, being more critical of those values and principles. And I believe that we are today, right? And I think that has to do with authors like Crenshaw, that has to do with conversations like this one and people saying, well, do you also mean me in your conversation? When we're talking about freedom and we're talking about at least respect, are you including me? And I think by having those conversations, and we are, and I wholeheartedly believe that we are progressing, I think we're getting there. But as to why we haven't got there, I think it takes a long time. I mean, people think that the U.S. is an old country. It's really not. We were, it was not that long ago that we were founded. It's not that long ago that we had a tumultuous history. We've had milestones and, and definitely great markers of progression, but that's just going to be a continuous journey. And I think that's something that, yeah, it's, I don't think we're going to reach a, aha, everyone's great and we respect everybody's freedom. I think this is going to continuously be a work in progress. And especially for a country that's fairly new, right? Um, I think it's going to take time and I think it's going to take you all to change it. You know, generation after generation, they're going to, they're going to try, they're going to go and there's going to be a new generation and they, it's their responsibility. It's now on you to ensure that these conversations continue to happen. Other questions? Yes. I should stand in a neutral 
location. There you go. Yeah. Um, how do you think your upbringing would have been better if there was greater hijabi representation in media or anything? Hmm. I don't know if it would be better. I think I'm pretty content. You know, and I'm saying I'm content because the struggles and the difficulties that I face is essentially what made me, right? Not just as a hijabi, but as a woman, just as a person. I think seeing the way that my parents, you know, grew up in this, not grew up when they immigrated to this country, my upbringing, um, you know, I, I think this is an Islamic concept. We try not to question the past, but we believe that the past has a reason as to, you know, why things shape out in the future. So I don't want to mull over it too much, but how would it be better? I mean, I think the less bullying in school would have been nice. I really don't know if that would have, like, changed my life that much. But who knows? Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that everything that we've gone through has a purpose and a reason. And then, therefore, we now are blessed and privileged to be in situations that we can do something else for somebody else. So um, in a very cliche way, I don't think I would have changed much. Like after they're married, they then wear a wig, mm -hmm. and the young children don't wear. Do you start to wear a hijab at a certain age, or is it when like little children? Do they, you know, because I've never seen a little small girl with a hijab on. So yeah. Do they wear it? Do you start to wear it at a certain age? Yeah. So that's a great question. So in the Islamic faith. Um, women are told to wear and put on the hijabs, the very specific hijab, right? So like covering your hair, you know, up to the ankles and you know, your, what are these called? Wrists. Um, oh, wow. Um, when a woman hits puberty, right? And so does that mean a woman hits puberty and every single Muslim woman suddenly puts on the hijab? No, it depends on, you know, how practicing, how conservative they are. Some people wait earlier. Some, some people do it earlier. Some people do it later. Some people wait for other markers uh, in their life. But from a technical religious standpoint, um, that's, you know, what's, that's what the Islamic faith says. And then, of course, there's lots of, like, grays and um, it varies by culture and it varies by families. Does that answer your question? Yeah, interesting. And yeah. then when you're home, do you wear it at home, or do you take it off at home? Like, is your husband allowed to see you, or your spouse, or a significant other without it on? Yes, great, great question. I'm so glad you asked. Um, so, no, so Muslim women, right, they, you, they don't have to wear the hijab, not in front of their spouses, brothers, um, uncles, grandparents, so I'm specifically picking at the male figures. Um, so no to them, right? Essentially people that you don't marry, right? And obviously a husband after you marry. Um, so my husband, for example, I wore the hijab before I got married. After I get married, no, go home, take it off. Like I take off my pants, you know, just trying to get comfortable, right? And But when we're out and we're in public, right? And you've seen, especially in Muslim majority countries, there are centers for just Muslim women. So if, like usually they're in an area with other Muslim women, they, they don't cover it. But the prescription um, is for men. Um, and like men that you can like have intimate relationships with and so like usually the men in the family are off limits it's yeah you're free my brother good, wish good I questions. wore a hijab he doesn't want to see me yeah. <laughs> more of the questions comments you know can I share a, a, a something that happened to me last Friday if you will um, and I'm Muslim, but I'm not. I, I've chose not to wear a hijab. I don't know where that will be in a few years. Who knows? But I am not wearing a hijab. And last Friday, I went to a neighborhood um, that I wasn't too familiar in, but it was raining. And so I had a scarf on, just a regular scarf, and I put it on my head to go to the pharmacy. And I will tell you, I had some anxiety, right? Because I'm a, a brown person. Right, and so now, in addition with wearing a scarf, I was like, "Oh, they they'll know, or oh, they'll they'll you know, it kind of they'll find I, out." Yeah, they'll find. It, it wasn't it wasn't um, thoughtful. It was it was just like my inner anxiety came up, and I'm like, "Oh, this what this is what my sisters who wear hijab must feel." I don't know, right? Because I'm not overtly, you know, because I don't wear the hijab, but maybe you can assume, maybe I get South Asian for sure, but, you know, I had that, and I was like, wow, it really felt, um, like, worrisome, I felt unsafe, I felt, and so I just wanted to kind of put it out there in terms of, 
maybe if you've experienced that, I don't know, here at Hofstra, right? We want to really want to know what your experiences are, what your experiences are about that, especially you shared, you know, stats about in terms of um, how people feel. And so I'm just curious, I want to put it to you and to the folks here, what they might have observed or experienced themselves. It's the airport that freaks me out every time. You're just like, secondary screenings, gonna come. Oh yeah, It always comes. Um, I think that's where I feel the similarity. They do this new thing now, they used to pat my head for me. Now they say, pat your own head and let us test your hands. It's like, again, the math ain't mathing, but all right, we're just, just trying to go to LA, but we'll do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird sometimes. Yeah, definitely uneasiness, mm. right? Definitely, mm. I, I did feel unsafe, I will mm. tell you. I was like, oh, should I be careful? Should I? And it wasn't a bad neighborhood at all, right? But I still felt potentially very visible. Mm. You know, and again, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not a small person. I'm visible, I feel like, generally. But this I felt, you know, I know about Islamophobia. I know that folks are getting targeted. I know I've had experiences in, within my family members who do wear the hijab, right? Um, and so I know it happens, you know, but it, it hasn't happened to me for that. It hasn't hap it's happened to me for other reasons. Um, you know, I get, like, you speak well. I get that all the time. Um, but you know that really felt uneasy, and so I, I had a moment where I was like, "Wow, this this must be." You know, I, I'm unsure how folks who wear the hijab feel. Did we have a comment or question in the back? Yeah. Are you debating? Because she doesn't want to say her opinion, but she will after I give my opinion. <laughs> but you know, so from a hijabi and a non-hijabi, two opinions. But I would say I've been wearing the hijab for a very long time, probably since I was like, I started wearing it when I was like in first grade, but that's because I went to Islamic school. So like all the little girls would wear it. And then I personally started wearing it when I was like around 12 years old. And it's all I've known ever since then. So like when a lot of my friends, like my, no, Rida doesn't want to say, but like once she just like wore it or anytime like she wears it, sometimes she feels a little bit like uncomfortable. Like there's like a spotlight on her. I'm sorry, I took your voice, but. <laughs> But I've heard that opinion from a lot of my friends. Like, when you, like, don't wear it and you just wear it for, like, a day or for Ramadan or you go for, like, prayer and you wear it, it just feels like a very big shock because of the looks that you get, looks that I'm just, like, kind of accustomed to now. But I would say that the m most fear, like, that I felt like closest to you or what you were talking about was when Christchurch happened. Mm -hmm. After that, I was, like, going outside just felt weird because like yeah it literally did feel like there was a target on my head like if there's someone in our community on Long Island that feels like the guy the shooter from New Zealand about Muslims the way that he feels all it takes is one second for somebody to pull out a gun and shoot you in the head and a situation like that has even happened here I think in America where I don't remember exactly but there was um, a husband a wife and I think one of their siblings um, was shot I think in a parking garage I don't remember exactly mm -hmm. but it was Chapel it was Hill Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was something like that. And I, I just kept being reminded of that moment. Like, it really just takes one second for you to be killed because of your faith or what you're wearing on top of your head. And it's a very scary thought. But, like, I had to remind myself of the strength that I've carried with me and that my mother's given to me throughout my life. And it just keeps you going. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Other thoughts, questions? We have a few more minutes. If you have some uh, burning questions and thoughts right now, this is a good time. Then we're going to have some opportunity to, yes, to uh, open up and have some uh, snacks for a bit. Here you go. Hi. First, thank you so much for this talk. Honestly, you were a great speaker, and you represented Islam in a very beautiful way. I never heard someone talking about Islam that way, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk about one experience and then I'm gonna go with a question. So I am Lebanese, I am Muslim, and when I mentioned to one of my friends here in the US that I like shooting, it's one of my favorite sports, and FYI, if you never tried it, it's the best. <laughs> it's like a, the best stress relief. Um, I just mentioned that, I was like, oh, oh my God, I really want to go like to a shooting club and just like get all the stress out. She was like, Sarah, you can't say that, like never again. I was like, oh my God, why, why? <laughs> She's like, you're Muslim, you're from Lebanon, and you like shooting, you are a terrorist. I was like, what? So, 
What are your insights on that? And what do you think we as a Muslim community can do to maybe alleviate this stereotype and this and misconception, I'm going to mm. say? Mm. If you want, I have a membership to my local shooting club. We can go together. There you go. I once went with a group of friends and family on on Eid. Um, it was awkward for people to to say the sense, but it was also a lot of fun. So I hear you on, uh, on that weird inter intersectionality. I am going to push back on your question a little bit. What can we do to alleviate some of the perceptions? I think it's twofold. I think the first half is we we do what we do, right? Like you exist you go to school you have interactions you meet people you just you live your daily life honoring your whole self and I say that because you know and, and I really credit my dad who once told me this he's just like people don't need to need to meet me an imam right or a religious leader from the Muslim community to change their minds about Islam they just need to meet a regular person and it's sometimes through like the, the smallest of things um, I remember I was actually just talking to a friend about this so he was in the World Trade Center um, when it came down and his co-worker was telling him a story that you know at, she had gone home and she was talking to her father and her father was like really relieved that you know she was safe and he started accusing him right this Muslim guy of like having a part in it and it, whether that was deliberately or just like coming from the same community and she pushed back and she was just like you're talking about Tarek like he's the nicest guy I've ever met like he's been so sweet to me this entire time that we've worked together like the thought was so egregious to her because this is just a regular nice co-worker who happened to be Muslim and I think the organic it has to happen organically. I think sitting and lecturing someone as to perhaps why their biases or thoughts are bad very rarely brings benefit. Um, I know debates are like a hot thing, but, you know, it's just not my cup of tea. It's just a matter of if you want to ask me a genuine question about my faith, I'm not a like a religious authority whatsoever. Like, like I'm just trying to go home and have some pizza and go to work and save up some money so I could possibly go on vacation, right? Like my most Muslim Americans, like they just want their kids to have a good education. They just want to get good jobs. They want to give back to their community. They just, you know, want to watch Netflix and not get offended that, you know, the character in Elite takes off her hijab off again, right? And so like there are so, the, the, the prop, not the problem, but the problem is so much bigger than us. And I, I say that cautiously because I think it's really unfair to put an entire perception on a handful of people. Like, what does that do for someone who, it's one thing bringing up wanting to raise like a confident 14 year old or we wanting to be confident Muslim people. It's another thing to feel the need that you gotta keep like an encyclopedia in your back pocket because like when you're gonna go get Starbucks, someone's gonna stop you and ask you like, hey, see that you're Muslim. Can you like tell me why ISIS exists? And it's just like, I could go around the whole, like, okay, so the political conflict in Syria started in, right? Or I could just be like, why are you asking me? Why me? Do you think I'm, like, Google's your friend, right? Or go ask an expert or a PhD scholar or someone who studies this. Because I think of all the times where I was just a kid in public school and all of a sudden was asked to be, you know, and I was one of the very few, I was the only hijabi, and... Uh, I, I remember so clearly, I, so I was an athlete in school, and so during like a basketball game, one of the refs came up to me, and he started looking at me up and down. I was the only hijabi on my team. And he was just like, do you have something on you that could hurt other people? Because we think you're a, like, you could hurt other people. I was like, bro, just call me a threat at this point, right? And I just remember like my sassy 15-year-old self, and I was like, the game in my head, brah, right? <laughs> and the guy just looked at me, it was very cringe. It was a very cringe moment in my childhood. <laughs> And he just, like, he was very shocked. I'm like, you're going to sass a teenager. A teenager is going to sass you back. But it represented something. Like, I'm not a walking. And, like, why am I a harm? And why do I have to sit here and explain to you what my faith is? I'm just trying to play basketball, right, with my group of, like, teammates and my friends. And so I just think putting that responsibility on just, like, everyday people is a lot. Like, we're, we're trying to figure it out ourselves. I'm trying to figure out how to be a good person, a good Muslim, a, you know, like, do my job, do all these things. And so asking people or asking us or having other people ask us to constantly defend 
our faith or break down misconceptions. It's different. I'm a journalist. That's part of my job, right? And there are people who do this for a living. They love it. They want to. All the imams in the mosque, they literally sit there in the offices waiting for somebody to walk in and ask them religious questions, right? But like maybe your classmate just wants to make it to lunch. And so I would say really tapping into the emotional intellect and discerning when someone is genuine and it's an answer that you do have and you want to respond and maybe where you're just like uh, not the time and day it's not me but I can give you someone who could answer your question for you and I think that's the role that we play because you just burn yourself out and it's going to internalize a lot of hate you're going to be resentful and you're just going to be tired and defending your identity defending why you're breathed defending your faith every single day that takes a toll it definitely takes a toll thank you what did you say, Roy? That the game in my head, bro? Girl, what? I don't want to remember. I what? like put that way back in my brain. No, no, no. That's a perfect way to end this talk. <laughs> How? What a beautiful. I'm so glad you share that. How? What a perfect way. Thank truly. You. I'm slightly cringing on myself. <laughs> no, it's not a cringe moment. I love it. It's awesome. Um, but thank you so much, Roy. This has been, you know, I hope for all of you, maybe an opportunity to reflect maybe an opportunity to challenge your own thoughts. Maybe now you have additional thoughts. Maybe Google, you're going to chat GPT stuff. Who knows, <laughs> right? There's other opportunities for you to learn. Um, you know, research, find out, ask questions, right? And hopefully this is maybe have given you that space to explore. Thank you so much for with again. Thank you, Asma, for creating this MSA. All the supports, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. We have some food in the back here, so please help yourself, and we'll be available if you have any additional questions. So thank you so much, and have a good evening.